create through listening to the Dharma. May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. And then the next verse of prostration to the bodhisattvas of the world and our own future bodhisattva. I bow down to the bodies of him in whom the sacred precious mind is born. I seek refuge in that source of joy who brings to happiness even those who harm him. And just imagining that while we receive these teachings that all beings everywhere are touched by them because we truly do represent all living beings by us, um, by us being here. Um, so I wanted to say just a couple things to start, uh, homework being one of them. Um, so homework is not to stress anybody out. <laughs> you know, the way of, of uh, engaging with Dharma, it's said to be there's, there's three things that we do. We study or listen to the teachings, we reflect on them, and we meditate on them. And um, so the homework is just a tool to help us kind of keep the mind percolating on the topic as much as we can in our, in our life. Um, because it said there's actually a danger, and I was thinking about this in, in COVID times, you know, one of, the, one of the amazing things about times is that we have access to all these teachings online. I mean, there's, you could watch teachings all day, every day. You could, there's so many things available. It's almost overwhelming. Uh, and that's a real benefit. Uh, the trick is that we don't want to get into, a, and I, I was noticing this myself, which is why I'm bringing it up, is we don't want to get into a frame of mind of collecting teachings um, without integrating them. Because what can happen is um, it's called becoming, becoming hardened to Dharma. And, you know, it's said that when that, that Dharma is like, is like butter and um, our minds are, are like a, a leather pouch, are, are like leather. And, and so when you receive a teaching, if, you, if it's like butter and you work it in to the leather, you work it into your mind, your mind becomes very soft and malleable and serviceable as the Dharma starts to affect the mind. But if you just use the, your mind like a container and just receive a lot of Dharma teachings, but you don't actually work it into your mind through reflecting and meditating, then it said you know, in the old days when they used to carry butter in leather pouches, that leather pouch would become very hard to the point where the butter could no longer penetrate it. I mean, it became a great container for butter, but the butter couldn't penetrate and the leather couldn't become soft. So, you know, when we're listening to this Dharma teaching or any Dharma teaching that we have the, the opportunity to be exposed to, it's really important to try not to just leave it as information and really try to integrate it in some way, even if it's just a simple way, but, but somehow help it to work its way into our minds. And, you know, it said one of the, one of the dangers there's like one of the danger signs that we're becoming a little bit hardened to Dharma is if we have the thought, oh, oh, I've heard that before. Oh, oh I know that. I, I've heard that before. Whereas if our mind has become worked with Dharma, even if it's something we've heard before, it's almost like we're hearing a favorite song. It touches our heart, like it reminds us of an experience that we've had and a way that our mind has been moved. And so there's this just very heartfelt resonance with, with any teaching that we hear because it's striking us at a different place, an experiential place instead of just an intellectual place. So I just wanted to encourage all of us, including myself, because there's other teachings I'm watching as well, um, to remember those three parts that we're listening or studying. Then we want to reflect on it. You know, just think about does it, what do we think about that? How does it apply to our life? Do we agree? Do we not agree? And then to actually spend some time, you know, in meditation, in kind of deep contemplation and see if we can move our mind a little bit in that, try to have some kind of experience where if we had to describe it to somebody else in our own words, we could do that. 
and and actually one of the things about um, teaching, which I'm remembering since I haven't done it in so long, is it's uh, it's quite a gift because you're accountable for the information in a very different way than than if you just read about it or you go and listen to a teaching. If you actually somehow have to come up with how I'm going to explain this to somebody else, you have a completely different relationship with the material. So. One of the things in discovering Buddhism that was rec that we recommended when when the program was put together was to have something called um, public exams. It's something that Lama Yeshe used to do. I'm not saying we're going to do it. Don't worry. But I'm <laughs> it's easier in person. But um, one of the things that Lama used to do is he would very spontaneously bring up a student from the audience, <laughs> one of his students, and have them sit, I don't know if it was in front of the throne or on the throne, I was not, I didn't have the uh, opportunity to meet Lama, but I did hear about this, and he would ask them a Dharma question, and they would have to answer to their peers, you know, give a short on-the-spot Dharma teaching, and they said it was actually quite terrifying, but it trained a lot of you know, that generation to be teachers, and they're really quite amazing teachers. And uh, that was one of Lama's methods for helping people to integrate the Dharma was to put them right on the spot, put them on the throne and ask them a question. Um, so anyway, that was just something to, just something to think about, you know, when you're thinking about these teachings and it, imagine that you're actually, you're in charge of teaching this topic to somebody else and how would you try to explain it? And, and it's very helpful to see where your mind gets caught you like you realize, oh, at that point, I'm really just parroting. I don't, I don't really get that point. It doesn't hasn't moved my mind, or I just I don't have an experience of it. Or um, so really to try to uh, engage with the teachings that way, and with the homework, because again, I I find this with myself, um, because we our lives are busy and we get distracted, and this may not be the only class you're taking. So I I wanted to suggest that. You know, however you're able to do the homework is great. And if you find yourself thinking often, oh, I didn't do the homework, or oh, I, sh I should have, when instead of having that thought, in that moment, just remember the slogan. Like when you, when you suddenly, oh, I didn't do the, oh, oh, the ocean of mothers. Are, are you my mother? Uh, oh. Oh, who do you love? Right. Like, just try to remember the short little phrase that's the top of the homework when you think, oh, I didn't do the homework. <laughs> like, you could spend that, you know, that split second, those few seconds of mind engaging with the topic instead of um, making yourself wrong or bad or I didn't do enough or, you know, th like, that's enough. Even that's enough just to do that. So, um, I wanted to encourage you in that way, because sometimes, especially I've noticed <laughs> the meditations are getting longer. At least there's more words that I'm writing. <laughs> so it can look it can look a little bit intimidating. And I don't want it to be intimidating. Um, you know, I want it to be something that is in that you look forward to or that uplifts your mind. So um, the homework is not to meant to be one more thing to do or a should. It's just an, an invitation to uh, work this material into the leather of our mind so that we can kind of have a little bit more feeling for, um, for this topic in particular and, and any topic in Dharma that we, that we engage with. So that was the one thing I wanted to say. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of a recap. So, so, uh, last week, we really focused on the um, seven-point cause and effect instruction for generating bodhicitta. And this week and next week, we're going to focus a little bit more on the second one, which is exchanging self and others. Uh, but again, this all comes from Lama Atisha, who, um, as I mentioned in the first class, he was a famous Indian pandit. He was extremely renowned scholar. Uh, and he traveled to Indonesia to meet with Lama Sarlingpa, who held these lineages of bodhicitta. They, they were getting lost in India, and Lama Sarlingpa had them. And so Atisha went and 
on a boat for 13 months and got this lineage. He spent 12 years with that teacher to really embody and get this lineage in an experiential way. And then he brought it back to India. And then when he was invited to Tibet, um, because the Dharma was, was dying in Tibet altogether, he, one of the things that Lama Atisha did was he wrote something called Lamp on the Path to Enlightenment, which was really considered the first Lam Rim, the first step-by-step-by-step -step -step manual for how do, how do we put the Buddha's teachings into practice? You know, the Buddha was said to have taught 84,000 different teachings. And if you've ever tried to read different sutras, if that's all you had, it would be a little bit hard to know how would you put that all together for your personal practice? How do you actually develop your mind from point to point? You know, how, where do you start and where, how do you progress? And so it's said that one of the great treasures um, and one of the great benefits that Lama Atisha gave or that resulted from his going to Tibet was he had to put this little manual together called Lamp for the Path to Enlightenment. And it, it went back to India and they were, they said, you know, it was worth letting you go to Tibet just for this text that shows us how to put all this into practice and and you know that got developed and expounded on over time you know in our lineage now we have Lama Tsongkhapa's Lam Rim Chenmo which is really an expanded version Lama Tsongkhapa himself says that it's an expanded version of Atisha's lamp for the path to enlightenment it sort of fleshes out all those topics but the basic order is the same and Bodhicitta's a little bit farther in. And what, you know, what we started with, what we start with in the path is we recognize how precious our life is and that we could lose it at any time. And we don't really know where we're gonna go after we die. So we entrust ourselves to the Buddha and his teachings and, and the supportive community that has realizations. And, and then we realize we have to watch our, our actions of body, speech and mind because everything comes from karma. And then we realize you know, there's this bigger wheel of life, of, of suffering. And, you know, even just having a, a human rebirth or having a happy life in the short term doesn't guarantee happiness in the long term. And as long as we're under the influence of ignorance, karma, and delusions, we're going to keep circling. We're always on the precipice of really heavy suffering. And, uh, that's not okay. <laughs> we have to get out. We have to stop that. So that's, you know, the Four Noble Truths comes in at that point. There's suffering, and then there's the causes of suffering. But because we know the causes, we can stop all suffering. So cessation is possible, and then there's a path to that. And so that's the point where bodhicitta starts is is introduced so we've just we've we've learned that we can get out we can stop our suffering forever and you know normally you would you would go right into wisdom you would go into well how do you cut the suffering forever how do you do that inserted there is bodhicitta and that's because this is the mahayana vehicle so maha means great and yana is vehicle and so this great vehicle is the car that takes everybody. It's a huge station wagon. It's the big vehicle because, it, because of how many people it carries. So the Mahayana carries everybody and you can't carry everybody without bodhicitta. The path to personal liberation, which is the smaller vehicle, the Hinayana, it's like a little sports car. I mean, you can, it just takes one person. You can get free. You can get out. You can check out but you're not really meaningful potential. And there's a danger if you realize wisdom for bodhicitta without any bodhicitta seeds in your mind, any wish to become enlightened for the benefit of others, you end up in, in this, um, you know, there's different terms from it, but it's, it's, you know, they call it nirvana's complacency where you're, you're in personal peace, you're in like suspended animation almost, but because you had no intention to benefit others, your mind's energy doesn't go out and benefit others. You're kind of in this contained, peaceful space. And that's the limit of your, the, the limit of your contribution. You can't, 
because you it's almost like they say you have a, a very, very subtle form of, of self-grasping, but you're free from suffering. And, it, and apparently there were a couple of the Buddha's disciples who had realized emptiness and the Buddha tried to teach the Mahayana path to them, but they said, we can't, we don't experience suffering anymore. So it's very hard for us to generate this wish to, to help others get out of it because we can't really relate to it anymore. Like it's not our experience. We know it's more of an illusion. We just can't go there. So, so it's really important to, to get the seeds of bodhicitta firmly planted in the mind before wisdom, which is why at this point in the path, we have bodhicitta. And, 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 and we're given two techniques, which eventually will get blended into one technique for developing that mind. And the first, which we talked about last week, which is this um, seven point cause and effect or six cause and effect. The way I was thinking about it uh, um, emotionally is, is yeah, you could, you could be free, but how could you? I mean, how could you leave your mother? How could you do that? And how could you, how, how, how could you? And that was just so awful that you would leave your mother to suffer forever and just check out. Like, who does that? And, you know, so the, the, the first point of the six causes and one effect is this recognition that all beings have been our mother, you know, that we've had this long lineage of lifetimes that, that has no beginning and all these different relationships with all these different beings. But the most significant of all those relationships is the fact that every being has been our mother. And it's considered one of the hardest realizations on the path to get. So if you feel a little blocked there, that's okay. Um, but one thing I didn't actually mention last week in the reasoning for that, which I was reminded of this week is, um, you know, we have our relationship with our mother of this life. And, um, and, you know, we can touch that. And we have a certain feeling for that preciousness, and what she gave to us, you know, gave her body for us as a hotel and gave us our very body. And if our mother has already passed, or if our mother happened to pass before us, die before us, she didn't stop being our mother once she died. If she, did, if she does die and we're still alive, we still think of her as our mother. That didn't end because she's out of that body. Or if we died first, our mother wouldn't stop thinking of us as her child just because we left this body. Like in her mind, we're going to be her child all the time. And why would that stop? Because we both lost our bodies. There's no reason. I mean, that relationship is still there. It's still precious. We just forgot. And so in that same way that my mother is going to always be my mother, even when she passes, if I'm still alive, when would she stop being my mother? She doesn't, she doesn't ever stop being my mother. I mean, I might not recognize her, but she never stopped being my mother in the same way. So you know, that tapping into that and the continuity of life, it's a little bit easier to break down that, that uh, our little boxes and barriers that we put people in. So I wanted to add that to the, um, to the mother meditation and um, just something to, to think about. And this, you know, the, as I mentioned, the the six causes and one effect is really about our relationships, you know, our, our relationship with our mother and how, you know, every living being has been every kind of relationship and, and it goes back and back and back. But because of that sense of connection, you know, if we really recognize the kindness of the mother, then there's a, a natural affection that arises because of just gratitude for giving us everything here. And, and then adding on to that, you know, this, the ocean of mothers, which I like, I like to say, you know, that any object we touch, I mean, you, you can't count the number of beings, the life force energy, the number of beings whose life force energy went into 
that object when I touched it. There's no limit. I mean, when you think of the origins of the material and how it got to us and who manufactured it and who brought it to us and the shopkeeper or the who delivered if we got it online. I mean, and all those people who support all those lives, there's no real way, it's really countless, you know, and all, all those living beings that are just in one object when we touch it or we use it. And so that sense of connection and, and wanting to repay that kindness and naturally kind of that a natural affection that says, you know, it kind of holds the person as something precious um, so anyway, so that we have that and then we have a natural wish that people be happy, you know, everyone should be happy, we're happy, we should have everyone be happy, and then, but you can't just keep stuffing happiness in if there's suffering, you can't contain happiness if there's things aren't right, and recognizing that then we have this, this wish, we want to stop all suffering, we want to make happiness possible, and for that we need enlightenment, that's bodhicitta. It's a, it's a mind that has the two factors of wanting to benefit others. And for that, we have to attain enlightenment. And it's called a, a, a main mind. So, you know, in our current, I mean, for me anyway, for our current situation, we're, it's a little artificial. I mean, we're just trying, we're creating the seeds. You know, it said, it said we're, we're like uh, the husk of sugar cane is our current bodhicitta. And when we actually taste it, it's something unbelievably sweet and amazing. And, but you have to start somewhere. And um, so this week, as we get into uh, the second method of exchanging self for others, you know, it's really based on this, this text, even though it came to us from Lama Atisha, it was initially taught by a master, um, Shanti Deva who was in the, I think, ninth century. And um, there's a book called, um, it's called many different things, but it's the way of the Bodhisattva or the guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life. Um, and there's many different translations. Um, I have a very old translation by Stephen Batchel, but I got it, you know, in the 80s or 90s or something. <laughs> um, but Deva might be, might be, if not the, one of the most quoted uh, masters, uh, Indian masters. He, it's an amazing text. It's all in short verses. And a lot of the verses that I've interspersed in these meditations that we're doing are from Shantideva's text. And uh, it said that Shantideva was, was a, a very secret practitioner in the monasteries. And he was known as Mr. Three Things. He just ate went to the bathroom and slept. And um, that's what he was known for. <laughs> and so the monks at the monastery, I think it was at Nalanda, they decided that they were going to shame him for not really being a good monk. And so uh, they invited him to teach. And they built a throne. I think in the text, they say it's like 10 stories high. I don't know how high it was, but it was so high they, and they didn't give any stairs. So the idea was that they were gonna shame him by making this super high fancy throne that there's no way he could get on and sit and teach anything. And ha ha, shame on you, Shantideva. But apparently Shantideva looked on and levitated and sat on the throne and then from memory recited the 10 chapters, each of which has, you know, 100 plus verses of the guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life. And he showed them <laughs> that you should never judge who somebody is because you never really know who somebody is. And um, it's really a remarkable text. I, can, I cannot more highly recommend it. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama also recommends this text as a main text that any of us who are interested in Bodhicitta, um, that we study this text. And it's super easy to memorize little verses from it. And this method of exchanging self for others is very well laid out. And, um, and then again, you know, it was sort of dying out and, and, and then Lama Atisha got the lineage and brought it forward. And apparently, you know, Lama Atisha had these two lineages 
and the seven point cause and effect was the public teachings that he gave. And for a reason that I've never really been, I've never heard exactly why, we have to sort of guess, but um, this method of exchanging self for others was top secret. Atisha gave it to one of his disciples, Drum Tompa. It was a, an ear whispered lineage and only he only gave it to one of his disciples. Drum Tompa, and, and then Drum Tompa gave it to, I think it was two of his disciples, Langri Tongpa and Geshe Sharawa, and, and then they gave it to, Langri Tongpa passed away, and there was a Geshe named Geshe Chikawa, and he heard somewhere this phrase, you know, take the loss upon myself and give the victory to others. And he was very intrigued by that idea. And so he heard that it came from this Langri Tongpa, and he went searching for that teacher. But by the time he reached the area where Langri Tongpa lived in Tibet, Langri Tongpa had passed away, but Geshe Shirawa was there. And so he received these teachings on exchanging self for others. And Geshe Chikawa was so moved by it that he decided he has to make it public because he never wanted it to become lost. It, he thought it was so precious. And he wrote a text called the Seven Point Mind Training, which I think Geshe Sherab is teaching right now. Um, but uh, which is also just a remarkable text. It's how to put you know, this exchanging self for others into practice. And there's these little slogans, like the slogan for this week, which is put the blame on one thing alone, is, is a, a translation of one of the slogans of Geshe Chikawa, because one of his heart advices was, you know, train your mind with slogans, like come up with little short advertisements for your mind. And that's how you can keep your mind engaged. And when you need it, when you, when you need these teachings, you know, if you have little slogans, it'll help you. Um, and apparently he taught this exchanging self for others, which includes a method of meditation called Tonglen, which we'll do more next week. But um, it's a way where you, where, you, where you actually meditate on taking the suffering of others upon yourself and you give away all your virtue and happiness and everything to others. And um, apparently it became a, a method that where people could actually heal themselves with this technique. And, um, and if you think about it, it, it does make sense in that karmically speaking, the only reason we have illness or suffering of any kind is because we harmed others in the past, which we would do out of self-cherishing. You know, the, the, I think I made a mistake and said Yoda, but it's Gollum. <laughs> It's Gollum from Star of the Lord of the Rings, but that my precious, the little tight, contracted mind that's me and mine and I and, you know, that mind motivated by that mind. Well, we're willing to harm others to protect our own happiness or to get what we want or we might steal or manipulate or, you know, kill or any. There's so many things that we might do just thinking of ourselves. And you know, so that's kind of the, that it, it's, that's the root cause of, of illness in, in this life would be having done that in a previous life. And so this idea of being willing to take on the suffering of others, you know, the meditation, you take it right to your heart and it cracks your self-cherishing mind, your self-grasping mind. And then, you know, in that, all that light in our heart comes out and is given to others. So it, it goes to the root of all of our problems, which makes sense why it would be a healing, a healing meditation in a very profound way. So the seven point cause and effect, beginningless mind, really important. Mother, really important. Exchanging one self for other uh, is a little bit more, uh, it requires a little bit more appreciation, I would say for, for karma. We really have to understand karma and, um, and a little bit of wisdom, you know, understanding what ignorance is, what self-grasping is, what the self-cherishing mind is and what it isn't, um, because that's what we're going to overturn in exchanging self for others. So what exchanging self for others means is um, 
we're exchanging self-cherishing, where we're completely self-obsessed and concerned only about ourselves, for cherishing others. And they take the place, that same kind of holding that we have for ourselves as individuals suddenly becomes, we have that for, for, for others, for all. But it's natural, it's not artificial. And they make, there's a distinction that's made. It's not like we're just putting ourselves in somebody else's shoes. We actually cherish their happiness. The way that we cherish our own happiness now, we cherish others' happiness like that in exchanging self for others. And so there's a little bit of an emptiness component to it. And maybe that's part of the reason it was secret. Maybe it was misunderstood. Maybe it was because this idea of take, taking on the suffering of others you know, one of the advices is you can't just go and go where there's a contagious disease and try to catch it. That, that's a wrong way of practicing this. <laughs> so maybe it could have been misunderstood. Um, I don't really know why it was secret, but it's not anymore, which is fantastic. Um, and so we're going to go through this. So um, it's based on equanimity as we start, which we've already been through, you know, this friend, enemy, stranger, kind of getting those boxes a little bit more fluid out of the way. And then on the basis of that, there's this, first we equalize, it's called equalize. We, we recognize that we're equal. Myself and others are equal in that we all want happiness and we don't want to suffer. That's pretty straightforward, okay? I mean, I've only had one person debate me whether they thought that was true or not, which was kind of an interesting idea. And we realized in the end that the person was thinking, well, some people like suffering, happiness out of suffering. And so that's why they were having this debate. Well, not everybody wants happiness and doesn't want suffering because some people get happy when they suffer. I'm like, well, it's still the same. <laughs> Whatever you identify with as happiness, we all want it and we don't want to suffer. So the equalizing, that's the most basic explanation, which, which you know, you have, to, you have to think about it, really. It's what motivates all of us. It's why we get up in the morning. It's why we do every action of our day is because we want happiness and we don't want to suffer. If we stay in bed too long, it's going to start to be suffering. We're going to get hungry. We're going to get uncomfortable. We're going to get achy. We're going to get, I mean, we can't stay in bed forever. So we have to get up. And, and, and if we check on the most subtle level, it's because we want to be happy. We eat, we drink, everything we do is because we want to remove some discomfort and add a little bit more comfort. And, you know, happiness and suffering don't have to be these big, grand, you know, joy and, and despair. It, it can just e even be the simplest a little bit more comfort and a little less uncomfort. We're, we're constantly trying to position ourselves, you know, to get more happiness, to get more comfort, to get more pleasure and to avoid not having those things or coming up with something that gives us uh, an unpleasant experience. And everybody's doing that all the time. We're all jockeying our position, trying to figure out, you know, how can we be, protect our happiness, get our happiness? How do we make sure we don't get, you know, meet with suffering and how do we get rid of the suffering that we have? And, and we're all doing it with this belief in a self. And because of that belief in a self, we can never really be successful doing this players around the chessboard thing. We're, we're basically completely out of harmony with who we are, what our relationship is, with the objects and people around us and what causes happiness and what causes suffering because we don't really understand karma. You know, we, we, we there's a chance to be in, in front of somebody else in line for something that we want. And so we're willing to put them behind us so we can get that object. But what we've just done is create the cause to be at the end of the line next time <laughs> and not get the object. So you know, they say the biggest problem with karma is there's a gap. We don't get the result right away. And in fact, you know, for the most part, most of our actions in this life, we won't experience the results in this life. We'll experience them in another life, in a future life. And most of the experiences we have in this life 
we didn't create in this life. They came from a previous, it's results from a previous life coming forward, but we can't see that. And so, you know, even in our actions, we don't really know what creates happiness and what creates suffering. And we think we did something really special, but actually it was our past life person who, who hit it out of the park. So we have a great life. I mean, they did a really good job. Um, but even, you know, friend, enemy, stranger, people, people hurt us or, or in, are in contrariness to us or contrast to us, they think what they're doing is going to bring them happiness. It's, they don't, they're confused. We're all confused. So we're all the same in that. And then there's this other really sexy piece to this of equalizing self and others, which is um, why is the boundary of self here? I mean, it's not arbitrary, really. I mean, if you think about it, there's this, there's a quote, uh, there's a quote from Shanti Deva. I don't have it, but I'll, I'll it's basically Shanti Deva says, you know, even though initially they were kind of unfamiliar, you know, because we've, we've, we've habituated our mind to thinking of, of the drops of sperm and blood of others as me, you know, now it's my body, but it was started out as a drop of sperm and blood, but my mind's so habituated with thinking of what's come from that as, as me and mine, you know, how, why is it such a stretch to just expand the boundary? Why does it have to be just here? This wasn't me. This is something from somebody else. This is other, actually, but I think of it as me. And that, I mean, why can't I just expand that boundary? I mean, sometimes our boundary of what's me and mine, you know, it extends to possessions. You know, somebody scratches our car, puts a dent in the car, does something, and then suddenly, that identification of me and mine is right with that object, as if it were my own body. I mean, if it's something that matters to me, or in that moment it matters to me, you know, or if it's a member of my family or my child or my parent or my close friend, and somebody does something to that other person, and I am a witness to it, I can get sometimes even more upset that they did it to this mine <laughs> than me. I mean, so the mind, so we can expound, we can expand the boundary of what we consider self and what we consider other. And even that line, kind of like friend, enemy, stranger, even that line of what we consider self and what we consider other is very flexible if we start to really pay attention. And the more that we start to bring others into our sense of personal experience, you know, like reflecting on how all beings have been our mothers, you know, our sense of collect collective being expands. It starts to expand, and other doesn't become so uh, separate from us. So that's equalizing ourselves with others, you know. And eventually we just stop using the word other because it even even using the label creates a separation. You know, I, I like to think of it as all, the all. And, you know, there's this, um, you know, the three musketeers or the four musketeers, all for one and one for all. I mean, you know, that makes sense. If you think of it, all for one and one for oneself, it's, it just doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't have the same kind of, <laughs> ring to it we even know that intuitively so you know whereas the seven point cause and effect is like how could you think only of your own freedom how could you with exchanging self for others it's like why would you I mean it doesn't even make sense it's not even logical that you would just be thinking of yourself you are you are another thing Shanti Deva says is you know when our body has a problem, when our foot is injured, the hand helps the foot. And in the same way, we're, we're, we're living beings. We're part of the body of life. And so why would we only be thinking about one small part of the body of life? Why aren't we, why aren't we working for the whole body of life? 
we're all part of the body of life. That's the all. We're all we're part of the all. Why would we separate ourselves from that? It's not even true. And it doesn't even benefit us to think of us like that. You know, the, the meditation of this week to focus on is, you know, after this equalizing of ourselves and other is the disadvantages of, of self-cherishing. You know, what, what, is, what does that even get us? It doesn't even help us. And I wanna make a distinction here between self-cherishing and caring about ourselves, loving ourselves, wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. Those are not the same things. So self-cherishing is a, an ignorant mind and an attached and very tight mind. And it actually prevents our experience of happiness. And um, so cherish in that respect is, is, a, is a tight, contracted, separating mind. It's not a helpful mind for ourselves. And when we do this practice of the disadvantages of self-cherishing and this week, when we're using the slogan, put the blame on one thing alone, the red flag that we want to avoid is it's not an ex a reason to go with the I'm bad, I'm wrong mantra. It's not, it's not a self-flagellation practice. It's not like that. I mean, it's because we love ourselves and we want happiness and we deserve happiness like everybody does that we have to break this tight grip that doesn't understand who we really are, that keeps us separated, even though that's not true. So um, the put the blame on one thing alone. We have to make a separation between us as a living being who deserves happiness and this self-cherishing that has us captured. And not only ourselves, but it's actually, it's, it's the disease of all living beings. It's the disease of humankind. And so when we look at the disadvantages of self-cherishing, you know, there's, there's the immediate experiences of um, feeling isolated and feeling separated. And if we really start to pay attention as we go about our life, especially we're, when we're in company, in the company of others or around others, I have to put that in quotes now, <laughs> others, um, because of self-cherishing, we're constantly, it's like we're in this bubble, this belief in this self-separated bubble and everything's in relation to that. So we, we saw that a little with friend, enemy, stranger, right? Like everything's in relation to this idea of the self that we have and pushing and pulling and is it helping us? And is, it, is this object gonna help me or hurt me and protecting and calculating? And I mean, if we stop ourselves at any moment of the day, for the most part, we're completely self-absorbed. Half the time we don't even, we're not even aware when we're walking around what, that other people even exist. We're just, we're completely captured by our own mind. And that's self-cherishing. It's a capture. It's, it's like the iron net of self-grasping. It's like we're in a prison. It's not letting us out <laughs> where we're in connection, in relation to, in dependence on, which is actually how we exist. You know, as Lama Zobar Mshay had said before, we're not trying to brainwash ourselves or we're not trying to, you know, have some fantasy to kind of help our mind think this way. This is what's true. What's true is we're interconnected. We're part of life. We're not separated. That's not true. That's this law that we've put ourselves in and, and that we can't seem to get out of, but it is, we can destroy it because it's not true. Um, and because of that, so there, there's the there's the existential feelings around that as we walk around in life, and the anxiety that it produces, and um, you know the the emotions that it produces, and then there's also you know the karmic repercussions of that. So um, you know this isn't a class on karma, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time of, on this, but um, you know, there's a, there's a quote from the Abhidharma Kosha, all the various beings there are and all the various types of worlds are all a result of karma. And 
you know, even, even a cool breeze on a hot day on the back of your neck, you know, just that little bit of pleasure, that's a karmic result. And, and by definition, any pleasant experience we have, you know, every time our mind comes into contact with an object, whether we see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, come into contact with it through touch, even our own thoughts, when our mind comes into contact with an object, in that moment, there's an experience of pleasure, pain, or neutrality. And those are all results. Those are karmic results. So as we're walking through our day, you know, the slightest little backache, a stomach ache, a headache, someone looking at me the wrong way, my not getting something I wanted, you know, we tend, we have a mind that naturally wants to understand why, you know, I have a stomach ache. I go to, what did I eat? You know, <laughs> when did I eat it? How, you know, that's how we think, of, we, we want to think of causes. We try to understand causes, but we never think of karma. You know, as Lama Zof Rimshe says, you know, when we catch a cold, we think, oh, we, someone left the window open. I caught a cold. We don't think, oh, I shortened the life of another living being in the past, and now I have illness. <laughs> we don't think like that. Or, or I take medicine, but it has side effects. That's also from shortening the life of other living beings in the past. Or rely on anybody. You know, I, I have a house now and, you know, I try to get people to come and fix things and help things. And, but people just don't show up. I can't get anyone here. You know, I have to find a better handyman. It actually has nothing to do with the handyman. The, the karmic result of not having people who are reliable around you is sexual misconduct. In the past, you betrayed a, an intimate relationship not in this life necessarily, it's usually other lifetimes. And so we, we go around not really understanding why things are happening to us the way they are. But if we look at it through a karmic lens, put the blame on one thing alone. Anytime we have any kind of unpleasantness whatsoever, it's because of a karmic action from the past that where we harm someone in some way, even just, even just being a little bit happy when something bad happens to somebody else. You know, that's, a, that's actually a really uh, easy one to slip into. You know, someone you just don't like that much and then something a little bit bad happens to them and you're kind of happy about it. Even that's going to have a result of something happening to you in the future and karma expands. So this disadvantages of self-cherishing is really based in a karmic understanding of every experience of our life. And in the same respect, um, every pleasant experience we have, every good thing in our life ends up coming from others, not only practically speaking, you know, in every single object and how it came to us, but, but karmically speaking, you know, to have a, a strong, healthy body is from having protected the lives of others in the past. Having material resources is having practiced generosity in the past. Having a, a pleasant appearance is having practiced patience in the past. So even people who kind of bugged us, if we practice patience in the past, we have a, a nice complexion. So, so even our enemies in the past, if we related to them correctly, we end up with a happiness. So, you know, first we had our bodies didn't come from us and our surroundings don't come from us. And now it's, you know, every pleasant experience we have is because of others, our action in relation to others. So we only have them to thank. And, and actually the only thing that we get that we did is the unpleasant stuff. I mean, that's... <laughs> We didn't respond correctly. And so now we have, you know, great and small discomforts and sufferings. So that's a disadvantage of self-cherishing, tight, constricted, separated, permanent, limited mind. Not true.
And, um, and the other thing is that when we think about self-cherishing, the disadvantages of it, um, all we have to do is look at our world and see that it's the same problem. And when I was in college, before I ha uh, met Buddhist teachings, I, I was trying to solve problems in the world. I wanted to solve hunger. I wanted to solve the possibility of nuclear war. I wanted to solve you know, third world countries and developed countries and the conflicts there. And I wanted to bring peace to the Middle East. And so I was studying all these things and getting involved in all these organizations in college to try to solve the problems of the world. And, and every problem solving organization I got involved in, eventually you would come up against greed, pride, jealousy, competition, ignorance. I mean, even, even within the organizations that were trying to help the problems, there was all this politics and jockeying around and, and it started to dawn on me, you can't solve all these problems unless you can fix the mind. If you can't, you have to, we have to be able to fix the minds of everybody because you know, there's poverty because there's greed. And, and disregard for others. And, and, and if that comes from self-cherishing too, and there's war and power struggles. I mean, if you, every single problem in the world, if we go to solve it and we look for the root cause, it's an ignorance. It's an ignorance that's tight, self-grasping, and a person or a group is identified with it and everything's done in contradiction to that. So, so even all the problems in the world, not only our personal problems and the problems and the challenges of the people that we know, but all the problems of our planet, everything is rooted in this self-cherishing tight mind. So we get determined that we're going to overcome that mind, not only for ourselves, but for the all, for all of us, because who wants to be captured by that? Who wants to be imprisoned by that? It's not even comfortable. It's, it's really not comfortable. And then, you know, the advantages of cherishing others, you know, we talked about that a little bit karmically, and also everything comes from others. And as Lama Zopar Rimshe likes to point out, you know, even the Buddhas come from others. I mean, the, the, the Buddhas come from sentient beings. You don't get holy teachers without great compassion and you don't get great compassion without sentient beings. So even our own teachers, even the Buddha himself, that came through reliance on others, all these living beings that are, that are in this with us together. They're the actual cause that we even have teachers in our lives. So, and, and, in cherishing others, we never lose. We can never, ever lose by cherishing others. We practice generosity, we practice patience, we practice non-harming, you know, all of those things. And then, and then we still benefit. I mean, even if we tried to help others and be only there for others, and we actually had the mind of bodhicitta and everything was for others, even then we still benefit the most. I mean, one of the benefits of bodhicitta is, is there's no faster path to, to enlightenment than bodhicitta. That mind that wants to attain enlightenment for the benefit of others, that mind that's focused on benefiting others, there's no quicker purification. That's the most effective purification for self grasping and self that keeps us trapped and there's no greater benefit every every good thing in our life comes from the actions that come as a result of caring about the people around us caring about the beings around us so so there's only there's only advantages I mean, so again, why would we just think about ourselves? It's it. How has that worked so far? How's it going? <laughs> we're still here. <laughs> Since the beginning of this time, we're 
we're still here. So I, I think it's kind of fair to say maybe it's not the best strategy. So far, it's not really working. So, you know, we get we, we get a determination. I'm going to overcome this self-cherishing, not because I'm bad or I'm wrong, but because this state of mind doesn't benefit me. And then, you know, because of that, I want to live for all. I have, I, we're all life force energy. That's what we are. And do we want to contribute to a contracted, limited experience, separated, permanent, none of which is true? Or do we want to embrace the fact that we're a part of life, that we're a part of the body of life, and we can contribute to the body of life? And everything that we do can contribute to the body of life. And there's no happier way to be. You know, another Shanti Deva amazing quote is, you know, all suffering comes from sharing oneself. All happiness comes from cherishing others. You know, ordinary childish beings cherish others and the Buddhas, I mean, cherish oneself and the Buddhas cherish others. Just look at the difference. I mean, look at the difference between ourselves and the Dalai Lama or ourselves and Lama Zopa Rinpoche. I mean, they seem pretty happy. They seem, pr they're pretty good. I mean, and what a relief. What a relief to not even have to worry about ourselves and find that that actually fulfills our every wish. And we don't even have to think about it. I mean, what, how fantastic. It just doesn't get better than that. So that's, um, that's exchanging self for others. Um, and I just want to have, I'm telling one, one short story, um, which is a little bit more about the emptiness of self. But for me, it was really, it, I don't know, for me, it was um, a powerful experience. So when I was in my 20s and I was in India, um, I had a boyfriend. He wasn't my boyfriend at the time. His name was Adam. And I was very obsessed with Adam. And even though we weren't together, we kind of got together and then we'd break up and then we'd get together. And I was in retreat in India and we had seen each other, but he'd gone off surfing in Bali or something and we weren't together. But I just had this emotional, every time I thought about him, I just obsessed, you know, when would I see him? Would we be together? Would it work out? I mean, just completely possessed my mind. So I had this dream and in the dream, I saw Adam and he was walking away from me. And I had all that emotion, all that angst. Oh my God, it's Adam. I have to go talk to Adam. So in the dream, I go after Adam and I, I touch him and he turns and looks at me and it's not him. It's another guy. It's not, doesn't look like Adam. And I said, oh my God, I'm sorry. I thought you were, I thought you were Adam. And he looks at me and he says, well, I am Adam now. And I'm not really understanding. And, and it turns out that Adam was a character in a soap opera. And that this man that I was so obsessed with was a character in a soap opera. And the actor who looked like Adam, because that was my Adam, he wasn't playing the part anymore. He had retired and he was already married and had two kids and he was doing his own thing. And this is the new actor who's playing the part of Adam in the soap opera. But that's not my Adam either because he doesn't look like my Adam. I don't feel the same way when I see him. And suddenly in the dream, I was like, oh my God, my Adam just doesn't exist. He just like, doesn't even exist. And I, I wasn't sad or upset. I just was embarrassed that I had like, all this investment in this person who never even existed. They just didn't even exist. And in the dream, I turned around and I was just laughing. I just couldn't even believe that I had spent so much time and energy obsessing about this person who didn't even exist. <laughs> and that is what self-charging is. It's the same thing. We're playing a part. We're just playing a part, but we've gotten so wrapped up in this identity of who this person is that we've completely disregarded the fact that this I who I identify with that I'm like this and I'm like that and my personality and I look like this and huh, all of that, it, it, it's just, 
piled on to something that doesn't even really exist the way I think it does. And, and because of that, all my existential stuff just keeps circulating, really unnecessary. So um, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to have that breakthrough. And one of the benefits of bodhicitta is even though it doesn't get at self-grasping directly in the sense of wisdom and the emptiness of that, like, like the Adam in the dream, it starts to chip away, you know, with the chisel of the dam, you know, because, you know, as we start to break apart that, that self-obsession, there's just a little bit more room for wisdom to, to grow and for that experience to grow. And emptiness can kind of slip in the back door that way. You know, we, we don't have to like spend, so it doesn't have to be so hard. It actually can come quite easily with bodhicitta. Um, so uh, that's this week. And um, the meditation, which is on the, which, which Mary's uploading, which we're gonna do now. Um, I have both put the blame on one thing alone, which is the disadvantages of cherishing oneself and the next slogan from Je Geshe Chikawa, which is meditate on the greater kindness of all. So it's a little bit of a blend of the disadvantages of self-cherishing and the advantages of cherishing other. But because we spent last week thinking about the kindness of our mothers and how every object we touch comes compliments of countless living beings, um, the theme more for this week is just to be aware with every moment of comfort, big or small, suffering big or small, news in the world, whatever it is that isn't working or is suffering, just remember in that moment, put the blame on one thing alone. It's just one thing alone. It's that tight, self-cherishing, self-obsessed mind that's all wrapped up in something that doesn't even exist. Doesn't even exist. But we don't know that yet. We haven't realized it yet. We haven't had the realization. Um, so that's that. And I think I mentioned this, but I'm not sure. The, the handout I gave that was uploaded the first day of the class, um, it's, it's just methods for de developing bodhicitta. And I haven't really made a direct reference to it, but basically, you know, it just talks about these two methods. It has the two methods, the outline of what the points are. And then at the end, it has the combined way of combining them all. And that's basically how I'm getting you know, how we're going through this. And eventually we're gonna put them all together in the next week or two. Um, but for now, we're just gonna do a, a short meditation on um, the disadvantages of, of self-cherishing in particular, uh, just to get a little deeper, deeper taste of it. So um, make sure you're sitting up straight and take a couple deep breaths in and out. Call to mind Lama Chen Rezig hovering above us and of all of our teachers and teachers of the lineage, those who realize bodhicitta and trusting ourselves to their care, asking for their blessings. to help us just get over ourselves. And remembering the living beings who we brought into this space surrounding us at the beginning. And in front of us, seeing the various groups of friends, those we cherish, enemies, 
those we just don't really want to be around, don't even want to hear if we can avoid it. And strangers, trying to specifically choose faces to fit those labels and groups. And reminding ourselves of equanimity, how easily and quickly these relationships change. Seeing the fluidity of friend, enemy, and stranger. Recognizing that although we wish to be free from misery, we run towards misery itself. And although we wish to have happiness, like an enemy, we ignorantly destroy it. We're all the same. We just want to be happy. We don't want to be in pain. And we're all confused. And if I think about self and other, where is that boundary? Is it fixed? Is it only this body? Can it include objects and people? What is me and mine? What do I relate to as myself? Seeing that even that isn't so fixed. That this body itself that came from others, now I think of as mine, as me. Why can't that happen with all forms of life? And what use has it been to think only of myself? What does it feel like to walk around in life every day thinking about myself? What do I want? What do I need? How can I be happy? How can I be comfortable? Is this helping me? Is this harming me? How that self-obsessive bubble has completely captured us, keeps us separated, contracted, limited. It makes it easy to disregard the life of another, an animal or an insect. It makes it easy to take things without asking, take a little more for myself, leave a little less for someone else. It makes it easy to rejoice in the hardships of others or be jealous, even when someone we love has something good happen to them. A 
from the moment you wake up every second of the day, with very few exceptions. It's me, me, me. Taking, wanting, receiving, but never truly satisfied. In fact, all the problems in my life, in the lives of everyone around me, in this world, they all come from that tight, constricted, ignorant mind. Selfish concern, either directly or karmically. If all the injury, pain, and misery of the world comes from grasping at a self, what use is that great ghost to me? And then touching the heart that cherishes others. Opening the mind to appreciation for all others do for me all the time. Giving me my body, my life, shelter, clothing, food, every object I enjoy, everything I use, even the teachings themselves and my teachers all come from the great body of living beings. Every happiness I experience comes from having thought of others in the past. How wonderful it would be to live in the awareness of the whole body of life, of living beings, to be in connection with that, in relation to that, in contribution. That is the purpose of my life, to bring happiness to all, And I am all. And so imagining just giving away every merit, every happiness, every good experience, all the richness of our life, all the blessings, sharing it with every single living being, imagining that everybody has all happiness and the causes of happiness.
breaking the chains of self-cherishing, self-grasping ignorance. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings be placed in the secure state of freedom and the bliss of great enlightenment. May all beings abide in the great equanimity, the expanse of mind, free from bias. May I cause all beings to abide in this way. Please, Guru Chen Rezig, grant me blessings to be able to do this. And then as we recite the mantra, again, visualizing that white nectar is the pour forth from Guru Chen Rezig's heart, enter the crown of our head, descend to our own heart, completely filling our mind, pervading it with love and compassion, shattering the remnants of self-cherishing and self-grasping. And then that light and nectar flows out through our heart, through all the pores of our skin and touches every single living being, granting them freedom, happiness, well-being, and bliss. Om Mani Padme Then all the lineage lamas and all of our teachers absorb into Guru Chen Rezig, who melts into a stream of white light and descends, entering our crown, coming down to our heart, becoming inseparably mixed with our minds. I bow down to the body of him in whom the sacred precious mind is born. I take refuge in that source of joy who brings to happiness even those who harm them. And then um, give the dedication verse. So we'll do, uh, do the first two and then we'll do the Shantideva ones. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow 
and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. And then we'll do the um, long life prayers of His Holiness and Lama Rinpoche and our teachers in general. Since without them, we would not have these precious teachings. The wish granting, wish, oops. The, we'll do the one before that, two before that. There we go. The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world. To the incomparably kind Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunath's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three jewels, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. And then the general one for all our teachers. May all teachers teaching true paths to enlightenment in any time, any place, have long and stable lives, especially His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Lama Zoba Rinpoche, and all our other teachers. May all their holy wishes be fulfilled. And then we'll do these dedication prayers that come from Shanti Deva's Bodhisattva's Guide to the Way of Life. And um, just recognizing we are life force energy. And so when we do these meditations and we engage in the listening and reflecting on the practices and teachings of the Dharma, we generate quite a bit of merit and positive energy. And these dedication prayers are ways of directing all of that body of energy so that it's not lost and it fulfills fills verses of these prayers. And so these um, verses from Shantideva are especially um, revered for especially bringing benefit to this world. And it's how all of this energy that we're creating in our mind will continue to expand and help others by dedicating it. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food, May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then, may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. And then sealing the vacation with a reflection on the emptiness of all that is, because things don't exist as solid, independent entities. Through the power of dependent arising, may all of our prayers be fulfilled. So thank you very much to be continued. <laughs>